for a lot of people, the Nigerian dream is to leave the country onto greener pastures. But the irony is the treacherous experiences they have to face to get to these so-called greener pastures. Just like the stories of Azu and many who were tricked into what they thought was a better life. In fact, turns out to be the worst experience they never dreamt of. Before I left Nigeria, I was doing a business. I was um, selling food with my mom in a particular um, oil company. And also I was a teacher. So I was doing the two together, assisting mom in the um, shop and also teaching in a school. So when school closes, in the morning before leaving, I help her with um, cooking, putting things together, buying the drinks, arranging everywhere. Then I go to work and then when I come back, I continue. But before then, I was in school. I was supposed to graduate. I studied um, architecture in Good State University of Science and Technology. So in my finals, that was 2014, I found out that I had a lot of issues. Um, it actually started when I got into school. I got into school 2010. It was 2, 9 to 10 set. So when we got into school, school fee was increased from 72,000 to 102. So from that 102, it was very difficult for me to get my school fee the way I was supposed to get it. Like the first school fee was easy, but then subsequently it became really hard for my dad to um, put it together. So I paid my fees late. Now, school, um, ASUT had this policy that if you pay your school fee, you get exam number. So almost all my exams from the second year till final year were, was written without um, exam number. So during the time they were um, publishing, because what they do is in the uh, final exams, they will write out all your outstanding um, results. You look for them, either go to the lecturers and look for them, and then at the end of the day, the ones you can't find, you will write. So um, I saw about 29. I started moving around, going to lecturers. It was as if they would say signing in and out, no recording. Signing in and out, no recording. So the whole thing got so complicated. I, it was just something I couldn't take. Well, I wasn't patient enough to go to as many lecturers as I could, but getting from my um, um, HOD, the head of department as I had then, he just told me, um, this is the much we can do searching for all of this because even his own course then, he was taking construction methods, even his own course then was not recorded. So he just told me, if your course, if my own course is not recorded, it means every other one you've written wasn't also recorded. So I assumed that was it. Getting home that day, I cried a lot. I called home, I told my dad, he was like, be patient, just try and see if you can look for them. I just quietly packed my bags. Without deferring the admission, without doing anything, I just packed my bags and I left. After everything, then I've started um, this teaching and then I joined mom. I met someone who was really interested in me and um, he told me he wants to get married. I just felt like, okay, you can handle this, you can get married and all of that. So in the long run, I got pregnant and I think that was what ended the relationship because he insisted get rid of the pregnancy. I was pretty sick. I was very sick. So I think he couldn't handle the stress and all of that. He said, get rid of the pregnancy. In my family, you don't do that. And that was my very first pregnancy. So everyone was like, you, you were not there. I gave birth to this baby. So four months down the line, that was 2017. I gave birth 2017 March. Four months down the line, family got a call that um, the people abroad will need four people. So they are like extended family relations. They are not really very close to us. I don't even know them. Like I've never met them, but some of my cousins have. So those ones that have are the ones that were contacted. And then I didn't even have an idea because my baby was just very tender about four months after, you know, so um, they started talking about it. I was hearing mom on calls constantly. They were talking about um, they need someone who she should um, see if I can agree. My younger sister was still in school. She was in her, I think, in her second year or so. 
So um, since I was the only one who, who is out of school, they can't talk to my younger brother about that because he also is in school. So since I was the only one who was out of school, every eye was on me, despite the fact that I just had a baby. So um, my mom talked to me, I said no. And then the idea was, my baby is still tender. I can't travel with my baby and walk. So she said, my mom is very young. So she said, she will take care of the baby for me to travel. Mom said, this, this is more like an opportunity for you to do everything you want to do. You want to go to school, you can work there, go to school and do everything. So that was everyone's idea, except my dad, my younger sister and I. No one talked to my younger brother about it because he was not around, he was in Auchi then. So um, I think we were standing alone. All my aunties were with my mom. So one of them invited me over. That night she sat me down, you know, you're, you're working really hard, you go to farm. Because when I gave birth to my baby, I was now um, trying very hard to see that there, there's no lapses in the family. We, we all hands on deck, kind of. Let everyone work hard to make sure that everything is going on well. So you're, you work really hard. So for me, this is like an opportunity. And then she had her son that just left to Ghana. I don't know what was going on with the guy as at then. So I didn't really ask if he was doing well. But for me, um, everyone believes he's doing well. So this opportunity too for me you have to so when she explained everything told me you need to um you need to really try this out because this is like an option that would help you to stop the suffering you're going to farm you're doing a lot of things just try this option that night was the night i now decided okay since everyone is saying they will take care of my son i'll go um they told us france the three of us uh, three ladies, and then the guy, Italy. They are my cousins as well. So um, two ladies plus me, that's three. Then the guy, because they said three ladies and the guy. Then the guy was to stop at Italy. It's not like the guy is joining us to France. So um, that was it. We left. Um, okay, there was no plan. No process. That's the truth. There was no process. They just told me, pack your bags, meet us in Benin. So I packed my bags. And then um, while, while packing your bags, make sure you have like two, three trousers. Uh, make sure you have like a sweater, a thick one, because it's really cold over there in Europe. Make sure you have... Um, they just told us a few things that they felt was necessary that we should have with us. So those were the things I put together. And then I got myself a backpack. I made sure I bought enough food for my son. Someone I, I initially planned I was going to do um, exclusive breastfeeding for. I had to cut short at four months just to join them. So um, we got to Benin, spent about two days there preparing. No serious preparation, they were just telling us they are preparing the documents, everything, we um, will get all of them in Abuja, when we get to Abuja, that the people over there, they are the ones who would give us the necessary requirements. So it was just like, we just came there for brief information and then we left. We got to Kano, we passed the night in Kano, but before Kano was when I started suspecting that something is not really going on right. We're trying to enter the north then. Um, some of these NDLEA, these um, um, drug enforcement agency, they saw us and uh, the man was like, everyone in this bus come down, walk him down. I even felt maybe they wanted to side the guys. But funny enough, they took all bags. They took, it was more like they took the young people's bags and then they kept it in one place. They would open it and at them. I'm not telling you, they send at them. I'm like, man, I don't have anything in my bag. So I was getting really scared. But the guy with us was like, calm down, nothing is going on. They just want to check. And he already had an idea of what was going on. So when they checked, they asked every one of us to pay to 2000 So um, the other girl, I don't know her, we just met in the bus, was putting on this um, long dress. 
is it Jalamia they call it something like that that was what she was putting on and then she was just saying a lot of things uh, not be trouble at the travel not be trouble at the travel and not commit any crime or now you know she was saying a lot of things and she wasn't even using any polite language like you're know, talking to officers she, I beg oh, nobody make nobody disturb her now travel she they travel you know Benin accent so I was like ah. Travel, they travel. Is it like we are going to the same direction or something? So I started suspecting. I said then that I don't really know what these guys are talking about. But at the end of the day, the guy paid. He paid for all of us, well, and the four of us, eight thousand, and then we left. So they took two two thousand from each person, and then they allowed us to leave. We moved on till we got to Abuja. We passed the night there. There was no response, nobody brought documents. They said the documents, they, uh, the person said we should keep coming when we get to um, Kano, we we'll get it. So we got to Kano actually, someone came to pick us. The guy that came to pick us was driving with one hand. He doesn't have one hand. I was scared. Like, but before he started driving, as soon as he just said, quick, 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 enter. Every one of us jumped inside the car. The next thing he started giving us this, um, Stop, is it hijab? Yeah, that jab for everyone. So, um, I didn't know how to wear it. So everybody was like, okay. So it was funny, kind of. I was like, is this like what they do in the north? Is it compulsory? Even Christians will have to wear this. So then my brother was like, you ask a lot of questions. Just wear it, you had to. So we moved on to we got somewhere. It was kind of bushy environment, the guy stopped. They brought another car that took us to a particular enclosed area. And then that was where we were for a while. Uh, and then after a while, bike came, bike carried us from there to one place. I, I can't even tell. The people on the streets were doing, I don't, I don't know what was going on, but it was funny, but not funny. Because the bike, the bike guys were not even riding normal. They were riding and jumping. In fact, these things that we see in movies that like James Bond something, it happens in Nigeria. Like I'm, I'm like, what's going on here? The guys were not careful. I had to hold the bike man so that I don't fall off. And someone was behind me, but I was still not comfortable to tell you how rough those guys were. So we got to another place. Then I saw a lot of Nigerians. I saw a lot of people who were traveling actually. So. They were saying different things, everyone with their own idea about where they are going to. And then I met this lady, she wasn't looking very okay, but she said um, the person who asked her to come is her sister. And that's because I think she's educated, but she has this um, health issues that the person said as soon as she gets to um, Italy, they will come pick her up and then she will get her treatments. So, People had different reasons why they were traveling. The ones I met there actually, everyone had different reasons, some for medical attention, some for money, some who were promised jobs. So I felt kind of, um, I felt unhappy at first. And then I was saying some things and then one guy came to me and said, see, if you talk too much, most of these people that are around here, they will lock you up here and then everybody will go, you will not go because you're asking a lot of questions. So that calmed me kind of, I had to like stop asking questions. After a while, they came to passports, as in passport photograph of everyone. And then um, it was that guy, that, that guy's idea of not um, talking that made me not to ask anything. A few hours later, they came with passports. The passport that got to me had my picture not my name, and every other detail on it wasn't me. So when they gave me the passport, okay, I, I had to memorize everything on the passport. Like, you are compelled to, you don't have a choice because that's like your gateway to wherever you're supposed to go to. So we took these things, a few minutes later, the bike guys came back. They took all of us again. You know the bike you, the, um, the person you entered with before, just enter with the person and then we moved on. So we continued till we got to um, the border between, Niger I don't know if it's Nigeria and Nigeria though. So the immigration officers there, they will take your passport, ask you, what's your name? You tell them your name. How old are you? You tell them, they just check, they give it back to you. 
So it wasn't like they were doing any critical check. They just, that question was the only thing they asked me. I don't know if they asked others any other thing, but that was what they asked me. And that was a pass for me because as soon as I said my name, and then I skipped the part where I had to teach one of my sisters because she is not learned. She got married when she was in primary six, so she didn't go to school and she has been in the village all her life. So I had to like teach her her name, the name on the distance. So I was helping her memorize her own name as well as memorizing mine. So it was, it was something very silly that of course, if I had a clue about irregular migration or human trafficking, I would have at least known that I was getting into something um, stupid, something that wouldn't be good for me. And then um, we left. The bike guys took us to a certain place where they had buses. They put a lot of us in one bus. I had to sit in the boots. So in that boot, it was raining that evening. It was, let's say, around 8 before the bus left. So it was raining. The drop, that's, the rain drop was on my body. Despite the fact I didn't have enough clothes on, I was cold. I was shivering. And it's not like when you're shivering, somebody else would help you because everyone is actually trying to save themselves. So no one is actually looking out for you. So you have to do something to help yourself. So I had to like draw, there is, there is something they used to cover the, um, the bus. I had to like draw that thing to cover myself. So um, we moved on after a while. I think they heard police, police. The next thing the drivers drove to a certain place, parked the car, zoomed off. We didn't know where they went to. After a while, other cars came. If they call your um, connection, you join another vehicle. If they call your connection, you join another vehicle. Just like that, they, sh they just shared us into um, different groups. We left. Spent about a day plus on the road. So we got to Agades. Now, when we got to Agades, um, someone just told us that this is Agades. So I say, yeah, Agades. I met some people and then the first room where they took us to everywhere was filled with flies. I couldn't take it, so I was like, oh God, what is this? Those girls there, they started laughing. They were laughing. I was like, ah, ah, how, how are you guys comfortable in this kind of environment? They said, you never see anything, you know? They, they stood up, left the room, came back, they were still laughing. I was like, no, no, no. So my sister told me that ah, you should be, just try and keep quiet and just observe rather than say, as in, say your feelings. It's as if you're just showing them who you are. I just kept quiet. I was not enduring the whole thing. They fly everywhere. I sat in the corner. I was just reflecting over the journey from Nigeria to that point. A few days, about four days later. So that, that should be like, okay, that's like four days, four to five days now to get to that place because it was from nine, from Benin to um, Kano itself was a day till the next morning. So from that um, Kano to, um, to that Agades in Niger was about, okay, let's just say three days. Okay, so from that point um, to that night, they didn't actually move us. We're still there till about four days and then on the fourth day they they came they told us okay to get ready everybody get ready you'll be leaving this night people were excited me i wasn't really excited because i didn't really understand we are leaving like we are leaving to where so um, my boss was like they said we are going to buy gallon buy gallon we don't have money we didn't even they, they had to they gave us just them um, ten thousand naira when we're leaving each so we don't have money. How much is the gallon? He said they are, they are selling in Sefa. It's not um, Naira so we are, because we are not, not in Nigeria. So I said, okay, find out how much it is. At the end of the day, what we had left with us was unable to buy us the gallon because we were buying small ones, big ones, small ones for each person. So at the end of the day, we sold the only phone that was with us. And the phone was not in our possession. It wasn't in my possession or in the girl's possession. It was only the guy that was authorized to use the phone to update them. So it was more like they were working with the guy. These people carrying us were working with the guy. 
I've never met the guy before. He's not really my cousin. He's married to one of our cousins, so I don't even know him. Now, it's more like they've already had this whole thing planned out before calling on us to come and join the guy. So the guy said, he's going to sell the phone. When we get to Libya, he will get another phone. Me, I wasn't worried initially. Just get us water since they said everybody will need water. We didn't bother to ask, what do we need the water for? Since they said buy, just buy. He bought the gallon, they filled it with water. So we had to carry it to the place where they were loading that night. So in the night, they started loading. I noticed each helix was carrying about 29 people. For my helix, they had about 29 people. So now the guys, um, the ladies will sit in, the guys will sit around the helix. So they have this wood that the guys will use to sit. And then they were arranging it like that till they got to our own turn. Now for the girls, you sit, you open your legs, someone else sits just like that. That was the arrangement. Then for me, I had to sit around the, um, what's it called, where you can rest your back. But I was sitting on a keg of fuel. That's another story. I was sitting on a keg of fuel. So for me, I felt that was a com comfortable place, right? I put my bag on the um, keg of fuel and then I sat on it. So I was feeling like that's more comfortable. I was even saying the other people sitting inside the helos will be feeling hot and they will be having a lot of challenges. So I don't want to stay there. I prefer where I was. Now, within one day from that place, because all the helocs moved at the same time, like all the vehicles moved at once, they started going. So as if the more we went in, from if they drive from one, would I even say up to a pool? The vehicle will sink. All the guys will come down. The lighter ladies will stay inside. If you're heavy, you come down. The guys will have to remove the sand. The helocs will move to the front, while jumping again. The helocs will move, get just one pull again. This thing continued for the whole day. It was tiring. And to worsen it, they were beating the guys. Like, when it's time to pack this sand, if, you're, if they don't see your hand doing it, the drivers have this whip, this, um, this um, pipe that you use to um, remove, to put fuel in their vehicle was what they were using to whip the guys. Like, at some point I started crying because there was this guy that looked really soft. I don't think he's from Edo State. I can't remember where he's from. But at some point he broke down like, he was like, which kind of stuff be this? Which kind of stuff be this? Now travel, they travel, no key person, you know? They were beating them in such a way that ordinarily it was heartbreaking. That after that whole day in the night, they packed us somewhere. And then I met somewhere from, someone from my place, from another Hilux. The guy started telling me stories, we were just gisting. And then it was more like a few hours, um, to, let's say it was getting to like midnight. This kind of breeze just started blowing towards us and then bringing sand. It was then it dawned on me that most of the sand heaping was actually done by that breeze. It was like rain. So very scary. I just told the guy, is this thing going to bury us? He smiled and said, eh, if you bury us now, it's just like we, we are trying to um, make it in life and then we did not survive. <laughs> I was like, God, don't allow me to die here. That was the first fear. So the guy said, just lie down and use something to cover yourself. If you cover yourself, probably you will sleep off. Because I didn't see sleep. Everybody, most people were already sleeping, but... I could not imagine myself sleeping in that kind of environment. I didn't know there was more waiting for us ahead. So, after that night, the next morning, the drivers came. Ay, ay, ay. I took my brush. I want to brush my teeth. They said, wait I want to brush. One guy said, we took water. This water that we are reserving, we want to drink. He said, I'm not going to brush. The guy said, even buy brush. They were laughing, you know. Some kind of weird behavior from some of the guys and the ladies. They were laughing. I better go. Reserve the water. I said, hey, God, so I'm not going to brush my mouth. I can't even wash my face. The guy said, you're not even brushing your wash face, you know? They were just saying a lot of things. 
And then the driver didn't even wait for anyone to brush, so we had to jump in. <laughs> that was the first heartbreak for me. Like, okay, now I'm going to just be smelling and dirty till we get to our destination. And who knows how long this journey is. <laughs>